Good morning, men, on this Easter weekend. As you all know that we were planning to do a men's breakfast and we had to cancel that. And so I just had a message in my heart and I thought, you know, we can get that message out by doing it this way. And I know that today, probably after this, that you're probably going to first of all go to a, a sporting event in a stadium, which probably then after you eat lunch in a really crowded restaurant, you're going to go to a cinema that's packed out to watch a movie, followed by a concert tonight in a packed out hall. Just kidding. And uh, so I'm sure that uh, as we enjoy our Saturday today, and most of us will just uh, be at home this Saturday, it has been a great time to slow down and spend time with family and really uh, appreciate those that you're close to. So that's one of the positives uh, as we go through this whole time that's been unusual. Well, I have this message in my heart, and I just want to pray and uh, give this out. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I trust you, uh, as I always do, Father, that you speak through me. I again acknowledge that I cannot do this without your help. So I thank you, Father, that your hand is upon me and you help me to teach and minister this message, Father. And I ask, Heavenly Father, that all that are listening would have ears to hear in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This uh, is a real simple title. It's just A Heart After God. And we're just going to look at King David. Uh, we want to look in Acts chapter 13 and verse 21 to start off. It says, Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And then verse 22 says, And when they had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do my will. So there's a comparison there between Saul and David. And main comparison is, you know, Saul was removed and David was inserted to be the king. And what's interesting is, of course, Saul displeased the Lord. And then David was put in as king. But as David was king, he made some huge mistakes. And I find it very interesting that although he made mistakes, that God said about him that he had a heart after mine. I think as men, this is something that we should look into because uh, I don't believe, uh, other than Jesus Christ who walked on the earth, there is no man that has walked on the earth that has been perfect in all their ways. Jesus was the only one, and that's why he qualified to redeem us. So I believe it can be very encouraging for us men to look at this, because uh, not only is it comforting sometimes to know that there's others that missed it, but they were able to do the will of God, but we can also learn how to stay on the rails and not come off the rails as we go th on this journey that we're on. So when we think of David, you know, he was, of course, a great warrior. He defeated uh, enemies. He defeated the giant Goliath. He defeated enemies of Israel. He wrote some beautiful psalms, and even uh, he even wrote some poetry. So isn't that an interesting combination, men, because you have a warrior and a worshiper? And I find that interesting uh, because, you know, us men, we, we have a tendency to be rough and tough. I remember the first time after I accepted Jesus as Lord that I went to the first church. It happened to be a Pentecostal church, and they raised their hands there. And I was like so uncomfortable, the big, tough guy. I came out of that kind of a world where you're tough and rough. And then I go there and I see these people closing their eyes and raising their hands, and I thought, wow. Uh, but praise the Lord, I was able to finally take that first step and raise my hands and worship God. So what that tells me is you can be a man and rough and tough, but you can also be tender and you can worship God. So we want to just look into this today and look at a few things about David. He was, of course, devoted to God, but he had some ups and downs. He conquered enemies, but at times he had trouble conquering himself. And so let's just start off and, and uh, 
Well, before we even start off, let's just remind ourselves like uh, something about David that when I say that he missed it a few times, we know that he actually committed murder and adultery. He So there was murder and adultery. That's like pretty big misses. But yet, let's remind ourselves in Acts 13, 22, one more time before we start looking into these things, that it says that God said that he was a man after my heart who will do all my will. What was different about him, him and Saul? Saul missed it, but God removed him. You know, what was different about David? Before we look at these things about David, I just want you to look at this pic that I have here. This is a, a, a photo of a train that went off the rails. Now, David, during his life, just with murder and adultery, that's enough for anyone to go off the rails. But then look at this next pic. This is a pic of a train that's on the rails, headed to a destination. This train is on a journey. I find it interesting that David stayed on the rails, and God said about him that he did all my will, and he was a man after my own heart. So we all are on a journey, this journey of life that we're on, and there's just four things I want to share today about how David stayed on the rails and how that can help each one of us stay on the rails each day. Let's not have a day where we get off the rails. Let's stay on the rails. So the first thing we want to look at is David was responsible. So his father, Jesse, David was out tending the sheep. And we even know when we read the story in 1 Samuel that David's, when David actually found his brothers, his older brother kind of said, belittled him and said, How, how's, how's come you're not out there with those few sheep that you're tending? And so David was out with those few sheep, as his brother said, uh, and he comes out of that place because his father sent him to take some cheese and various things to his brothers. So David arrives there, and here's what I see about David being responsible in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 20. It says, David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. So very simple there. You see, he rose early in the morning. That's responsible. He left the sheep with a keeper and took provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. Now, just this little side thought. There's some people that actually work very good till late hours and they sleep in. And in your way, you're responsible too. So please understand that. Uh, if you're one of the late night workers and those that sleep in, you're still working and you're still being responsible. But what we see here is David rose early. He left the sheep with a keeper. That's responsible. And took the provisions. Uh, that is, and he did as his father commanded. Then in verse 22, it says, Then when David arrived there, it says, David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage. So there again, we see that he's a responsible guy. So with these kind of things, when we talk about this, it's always important because we're in the church and this is the age of grace, the church age. It's important not to get legalistic when we look at these things uh, because legalism, it just brings guilt and shame and makes us feel demoralized. So as we look at this, we're not want, we don't want to go in that direction, but then we just want to we just still want to acknowledge to be responsible can keep us on the, on the rails throughout our journey. So here's like a quote from Daniel Webster. He says, the most important thought that ever occupied my mind is that of my individual responsibility to God. And I, I think, men, uh, it would be great if we all even got into that even category, the most important thought that ever occupied our minds as men is our individual responsibility to God. And you know, the wonderful thing is once God gets on the inside of us by his spirit and Jesus is our Lord, we have a love for him. And so ever, uh, ever since the time in 1979, January, when I received Jesus as my Lord, I, I've not been able to get rid of him. He's there. And maybe today you're listening to this and maybe you've gone a different direction and you walked away. You know he's there. 
and you know you want to come back to him. Here's another great quote, a quote by Albert Schweitzer. He said, man must cease attributing his problems to his environment and learn again to exercise his will. His personal responsibility in the realm of faith and morals. I like that. We all men have a personal responsibility in the realm of faith and morals. And so we uh, need to know that if we are responsible in that area, it can really fix our environment and the problems that we face in our environment. Now, Joshua 1 9, you see throughout the Bible that, like in the Old Testament and New, we'll look at both. Here's what God said. He said, I have commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's an encouraging scripture because uh, Joshua needed to hear that. And in, in trying and troubling times and difficult times, this is what God would say to us. I'm telling you, be strong and courageous. Men, we can be strong and courageous. It says, do not be frightened and dismayed. This is what we can do with the help of God by His grace and His empowerment. Then in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, this one says, Be on guard, stand firm in faith, be courageous, and be strong. So we have this privilege as men, uh, a privilege to lead, a privilege to set an example, to be strong, courageous, to be able to go somewhere and be the person that others look to, a peaceful person, a strong person, a courageous person, a humble person, a loving person, a compassionate person. This is who we can be, men. All of those things mixed together, a balance. So just a few things to uh, finish off talking about being responsible. Here's just some areas that we can be responsible. We can be responsible to God. Being responsible to God should be our first. Uh, we just looked at that quote. That keeps us on the rails. That keeps us going on our journey. We can be responsible to God's Word. I mean, like really, the great Smith Wigglesworth said the way that he really got to know God, it wasn't like by some spiritual uh, woo-woo, whatever you want to call it, some mysterious thing spiritually. He said, I got to know God through His Word. And so we want to be responsible to God and, and responsible to His Word. That keeps us on the rails. And then we want to be responsible to our family and our friends. Our family needs us. Our friends need us. We can be responsible in those areas. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of just being there. And sometimes it's a matter of just when we're around them, just displaying Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Just being peaceful around people is being there for them. Just somebody in the room being peaceful. Somebody in the room having some joy. Those kind of things make a difference. So uh, it's not as difficult as we think because we got the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of us and we, got, we have peace and joy on the inside of us. We want to be responsible to our church. Uh, we want to be responsible to our workplace. On the workplace, uh, sometimes it's not how much you say on it, your workplace. It's just you acting like Christ. Peace, joy, uh, humility, strength, courage. All of those things that we're looking at at the workplace. And then uh, we want to be responsible when there's challenges and problems. We don't want to dig a hole and put our, hand, uh, our head into the sand. We don't want to run away from those things, but we want to be strong and courageous. Face the problems. And uh, by facing those problems, there can be a resolution. So this just came into my heart. I was meditating about this and getting ready to give this word out. And it came into my heart that David was responsible, but not perfect. Being responsible doesn't imply perfection. It's important for all of us to know that. Anybody that thinks they're going to be perfect is going to be disappointed. And I do not say that as an excuse to be unperfect. I think we should all have a desire to be Christ-like and, and walk as holy as we can on the earth. But then we need to also realize that no one will ever be perfect. Jesus was the only one get the right balance on that. So we desire to be holy and walk holy, but yet we need to understand that being responsible doesn't mean that we're perfect. And, and David, one of his uh, things about David is 
he wasn't perfect, but he was responsible. Okay, then, uh, however now with David, it was David's attribute of responsible that kept him on the rails. In other words, he made some mistakes, but because he had this great characteristic, this great thing about himself that he was responsible, it kept him on the rails when he made his mistakes. He did the right things. It was how he responded to his failures that made the difference. So men, it's really um, really important how we respond to a failure. It keeps us on the rails. And by being responsible to all the various things we said, God, God's word, family, friends, our church, workplace, challenges, problems, that keeps us on the rails. One last very powerful quote that I really like, and this quote is from the great Winston Churchill, and he said, the price of greatness is responsibility. How powerful is that? Praise God. Let's look at the next thing that I notice about David, and that's this. He was quick to repent. And uh, so what does that mean? Well, if I would say in terms of importance, if we were going to make up a list on how to stay on the rails, I think it's important for every man to know that being quick to repent can keep all of us on the rails. Okay. Now, what repentance means sometimes uh, as after 41 years in the body of Christ, I've learned that uh, there's various beliefs about repentance uh, but in the simple, you know, without getting real theological, the simplest way that we can talk about repentance is it's a change of heart. That you're going one way, and when you decide to repent, it's a 180 de- degree retur- a turnaround, 180 degree turn, the total opposite direction. So if you're not a Christian, repentance for you would be you turn 180 degrees, whatever you put your trust in to save you, and maybe you're an atheist or an agnostic and you have trust in nothing, but for anybody in that category, repentance is having a change of heart and acknowledging Jesus Christ is the Savior and receiving Him and confessing Him as your Savior. That's repentance and change to get into God's kingdom. Then when Christians have failures and they miss it, and and there's potential to come off the rails, if a Christian is quick to repent after missing it, after a failure, and they run to God, that keeps every Christian on the rails. So David was quick to repent. When David made his failures, he didn't run from God, he ran back to God. And so he acknowledged his failures. This is one of the reasons I believe that Saul was different than David. Saul was not quick to repent, and David was quick to repent. God said about David, he has a heart after me, and he ended up doing my will. God removed Saul because Saul was not quick to repent. Saul was also not responsible. He actually did things that God told him not to do. So these are some of the differences between the two. Now look at Scripture in James chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, For we all stumble in many ways. Now, I'm only going to just read that one part of that because we just need to acknowledge that people that are Christians stumble. And then in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. There again, we see that the Lord is really helping us because he's saying, okay, you're, this, this can happen, I'm, and I'm talking to you Hebrew Christians now. You want to lay aside the weights, things that weigh us down, and you want to, the sin, you want to make sure you take care of that. Lay it aside so you can stay on the rails and run your race with endurance. And then uh, going over to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, uh, that says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So in one sense, you know, this is wanting change. This is like saying, okay, all the good and the bad, I'm going to forget those things because I want to keep pressing on. So thank God for all the victories, but I I need a victory tomorrow. Uh, The failures, I'm not thanking God for those, but I'm I'm putting those things behind me, and I'm going to press toward the mark. 
It's another way to say that, hey, there's change going on. Repentance is change. And then Hebrews 4.16, the wonderful scripture, that tells us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may, what, receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord gave us those scriptures for a reason, because other than Jesus Christ, there hasn't been any other Christian that's walked perfectly on the earth since Jesus rose from the dead, and he's helping us, but it's important to know for every Christian, every man, that we do not run from God, we run to God. We're quick to repent. I truly believe people that have habits can get out of even habits if there is a practice of being quick to repent. And instead of allowing a habit to bring you down into a place of depression, uh, run back to God, be quick to repent. And then there's something else we're going to look at here in the end that will also help in this way. And that's, well, we'll just get to it right now. Why wait? <laughs> so this is really important. Uh, when we talk about being quick to repent, here's just a few things. The first thing is uh, we want to be aware of our seat in Christ. Uh, we could say revelation or understanding of our awareness of our seat in Christ will keep us on the rails. Along with that, just related to it, is that we have been restored and we have been seated back into a place of right standing with God. We've been made righteous. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So it, it's really important to be very aware of that. Um, that keeps you on the rails. Here's another way to say it. That if we miss it, we're still seated with Christ because we have been cleansed and forgiven and we have been raised and seated with him. This helps us to run back to him. This helps us to be quick to repent. Just uh, the goodness of God and this plan of salvation that he had where he would cleanse us. And that cleansing is so amazing because we know in the Old Testament, if somebody walked into the tabernacle where the presence of God was, if they didn't belong there, they would fall over dead. The holy presence of God, the holy presence of God, we couldn't even get close to it if we weren't cleansed. Oh, that we would understand that the blood cleanses us and that that cleansing allows God to come on the inside of us by his spirit. So when somebody has a failure or misses it, we do not lose our seat in Christ. We're aware that we're the righteousness of God and we're seated in heavenly places. And this helps for every Christian and men run back to him quickly. Be quick to repent like David was. And so we can go up to the throne room of, and find mercy and grace to help us in a time of need. So we could say this, that our actions were unrighteous, but according to 1 John 1, 9, we can confess our sin. We quick to repent. We go to God and he... It's, we do not lose our seat and our righteousness, but the unrighteous behavior that we had is cleansed when we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I missed it. That's what sin is. And I just thank you, Lord. I just thank you for 1 John 1, 9, and I just received cleansing. David was quick to repent. Praise God. So let's look at the next thing we wanted to, I noticed about David, and that's David was mindful of authority. He actually remained loyal to King Saul in if, and I'm sure you've read this, but King Saul became jealous of him and he wanted to kill David. And even through all of that, David remained loyal. So he was mindful of authority. I believe this keeps us on the rails, men, where we understand that there's authority in place in this world and we're mindful of that authority and we're respectful. So like in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 4, it says, and the men of David said to him, so they like, well, well, let me go back before we read it. See, they were in a, in a cave, and Saul, the king, was looking for David to kill him. He went into the cave where David and his men were. So this is where we're picking up right here. 1 Samuel 24, 4 says, and the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, 
and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off the corner of Saul's robe. So David had an opportunity to put a sword through Saul, but instead he cut off the corner of his robe. So David did not listen to his men. And his men actually brought God into it. <laughs> they said, the Lord has you know, gifted you Saul. And even though that, that opportunity was there that he could remove the guy that hated him, he didn't do it. He was mindful of authority. So then picking up in 1 Samuel 24, in verse 5, it says, Afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. He even felt bad for doing that, where he could have, as I said, put a sword through him. But even that bothered David. That's how mindful he was of authority that God appointed. And then uh, the next verse in verse 6, it says, He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So even though David took the higher ground and he didn't kill Saul, notice that it still, uh, notice how he brought God into it. And I think that's what's important. What David did is he chose not to look at Saul's personality because sometimes the appointed authority, the personality could rub you the wrong way. He chose not to look at Saul's failures and behavior. He chose not to even focus on the hate that Saul had for him. He chose to be mindful and respectful to God-appointed authority. This is something that will help all of us because I'm sure we all have had to sometime work for somebody that we, their personality rubbed us the wrong way, their behavior rubbed us the wrong way, but they're actually the ones that are in authority. So this is really important, and this is something that we can all do. So verse 7 then says that David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So it's very important as we go on our journey, and this keeps us on the rails, because disrespecting authority can really derail us as we are on this journey of life and on our Christian journey. So I just encourage you, we can humble ourselves and respect authority. The last thing I wanted to share with you today is that David was a worshiper. He was a worshiper. He loved God throughout his life. And what's really most impressive about David is that he worshipped in some of his most difficult and challenging times. Uh, uh, man, if we can get, you know, we're rough and tough, and, you know, and we think we can solve everything with our strength sometimes. David was a conqueror. He conquered the giant. He, he defeated enemies of Israel with a sword. But yet he was still a worshipper. So he knew that God was more powerful than his sword. He knew that God was more powerful than his intelligence. He chose to worship God. This is so big for all of us men that we just can humble ourselves and be a worshiper. So important. So look at Psalm 63, such a wonderful psalm. Just going to read a couple, like five verses here. It says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. This is David in, in a very difficult time. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. Behold your power, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live in your name. Will I lift up my hands? My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Boy, we could talk about that for a while because, you know, sometimes, well, we go for a walk in the morning, and sometimes I wait to have my coffee after our walk. And then when we're coming at the end of our walk, I tell Patsy, I'm already thinking about that first cup of coffee. I, I do like coffee. And, you know, just the way that he said, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. 
just think how we enjoy food. But he's saying like God, God can satisfy me like that. God, he just worshiped God. He loved God. He was a worshiper. So we could say this about David, and this is like something that all of us men can do. David approached God with reverence. So man, I just want you to picture this for us, all of us, that when, we, when we're in church, when, when we're during the season where we're doing church online, even in the privacy of homes, even amongst your children, in front of family and children, men, that we humble ourselves and we are able to approach God with reverence. That's what David did. And then David learned to worship in any situation. So thank God that we can do it at church and set an example even to our family as men and lead by worshiping God, but even in a difficult situation. And you know, and sometimes our first response isn't perfect in a difficult situation because we're rough and tough men, right? And sometimes we say something we wish we didn't say because the pressure's on. But see, here it is again. It's important that all of these things that we're talking about we might have a bad first response to a difficult situation, but we can be quick to turn and go back to God, approach Him with reverence, and begin to worship Him. And it's amazing how He'll show up. You know, I just talked to a, a man uh, just earlier today, and this is a man that's been on the earth 10 years after he had pancreatic cancer. And he just told me today how he went to God when he was given a death sentence and how he just stayed in God's presence, and he's still on the earth today after 10 years. Pancreatic cancer, very unusual. He worshiped in a difficult situation. The next thing is that David fully surrendered himself while he was worshiping. And that's something that sometimes even in church we could look around and we could do those kind of things, uh, but he was fully surrendered he approached God with reverence in any situation. This is David, the worshiper. David sought God with all of his heart while worshiping. And that's something, you know, sometimes you just have to, like, you know, it's so weird sometimes if we're worshiping and all of a sudden we think about a to-do list, you know, and, and just like putting those things aside where we just like really get engaged and worship God with all of our hearts. That's the way David was. It, made, it kept him on the rails. It kept him on the rails. Then the last thing is that David expected to be changed. He expected his situations to change, and he expected to be changed while he worshiped. Guys, when we worship God, let's, let's like really understand that it's a time that we can be changed, our situation can be changed. We can, and, and you know, uh, in order for that to happen, David was fully engaged, just really for all of us to know that worshiping God and being fully engaged in that and approaching Him with reverence and pouring out our heart and doing those things, it can change situations and it can change us. So what are we saying today? Just in summarizing what I've said today, how can we stay on the rails? Okay, well, we can stay on the rails by the grace and empowerment of God. It's not us in our own strength. And so we just talked about these four things and we just wanna end right here. We're graced and empowered to be responsible. We're humble to repent. We're mindful of authority and we long to worship God. Father, I just thank you for all the men of Rhema Family Church and any other man that would be listening to this, Father, and even if other, uh, uh, if ladies listen to this uh, around the world, whoever's listening, Father, these things work for all of us, Father, so I just pray that, uh, there's, that there's ears to hear and this helps people to stay on the rails in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Well, I just want to let you guys know that tomorrow, Easter service, we have a guest minister named Tony Cook, and I just really encourage everyone to make sure they uh, get online in uh, wherever you are, on your phone, on your TV. Uh, we put it on our television. It's wonderful to see it on the big screen, and uh, make sure you just uh, enjoy the service tomorrow, and I pray even for tomorrow that you have ears to hear in Jesus' name. We'll see you. Bye-bye.